Now, one of the great challenges for dealing with COVID-19 has been to produce an effective, reliable test for it. How do scientists discover a test that works in the first place and what do they need to have at their disposal? Well, the answers lie in tiny microbes found in some of the most unlikely places on Earth. Some of them deep in the ocean where they've learned to survive and thrive in some extremely challenging environments. And by examining these microbes, could we discover more answers for dealing with future diseases. Well, to tackle that, I'm joined now by Robert Blasiak, who's the lead author of the Ocean Genome Report, which is being launched today, in fact, and by Julia Sigwart, who's a research leader at the Zenkenberg Research Institute, which focuses on biodiversity and Earth history. Well, thank you both very much indeed for joining us. Julia, let me start with you, if I can, because I just wonder, what is it about these sorts of microbes in really the, the deepest parts of the sea um, that offer properties and values that, that you can work with, that you want to get hold of? Well, one of the most important habitats in the deep sea is hydrothermal vents. And these aren't necessarily in the deepest part of the oceans, but they're scattered around the Earth in all oceans. And they're areas where there's volcanic activity in the seafloor, maybe two miles below the surface, and in areas where there's no sunlight and really extreme pressure. So we depend on the sun for all of our energy and our food. But in these habitats, all of the energy comes from microbes that can harness the chemical energy in these volcanic fluids. And these microbes and the organisms that live in hydrothermal vents can withstand extreme heat and extreme pressure in uh, conditions where if we were there, we would literally be crushed or boiled alive. Right. So, they've got, they've, they're, so they've got properties and qualities we simply don't have and maybe didn't even know about, in which case by, by harvesting those and harnessing them, it, can we go so far as saying the ocean may offer answers to dealing with something like COVID-19? Absolutely. It's led to fundamental scientific breakthroughs, including the way that we replicate DNA in the lab. And the basic technique that we use for DNA replication in the lab depends on enzymes that came from microbes from these very extreme environments, not necessarily hydrothermal vents, also hot springs on land. But there's products from vents that can also do the same product same properties. Right. Robert, you, you've obviously you've brought out a report right now, actually, you're launching it, which looks at who it is who's, who's looking at the ocean. I mean, the likes of uh, Japan, Germany, the US are putting a lot of time and effort into this, it would seem, but much more than other countries. And you would want to see a balance of accessibility, presumably, to all these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, if you, the way you described it and Julia did, it's, it's amazing. I mean, there's been life in the ocean for 3.7 billion years. It's more than three times as long as there's been life on land. And that means there's a lot of really interesting genetic adaptations that can be found by examining these uh, organisms at a genetic level. And there are a lot of marine biotechnology companies that are interested in exploring this and trying to find out not just if there are new medicines and pharmaceuticals we can develop, but a thousand other things. So everything from edible plastic packaging all the way to new enzymes and new, um, new products that uh, are based just on the genes of life in the ocean. Right, so the, the scope is huge, as is the challenge, presumably. If you want to sequence everything in the ocean in terms of finding an ocean genome, cost and, and sheer um, scale is, is presumably is virtually insurmountable, isn't it? Yeah, but we're traveling at light speed in this area. So 20 years ago, it cost about $6,000 to sequence a unit of DNA. Today, it costs about one cent. So that means we're sequencing everything as fast as we can. And all of that data is feeding into these massive databases of genetic sequence data, which are then the basis for companies or for scientists to comb through and to try to find really interesting um, properties and functions that these um, that these sequences and proteins can produce. So I I think that when we think of the ocean as a source of equitable development, sustainable development for countries around the world, we need to make sure that their scientists and also businesses and uh, biomedical industry that can engage in this area. Right. So it's, it's a... So, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, Roy. I did want to just ask both of you, actually. I mean, there's a certain irony in us discussing this. This is meant to be the, the launch of the uh, decade of ocean science, which has rather gone by the board, courtesy of COVID-19, of course. And yet, 
Here is a great example, it seems, of making the point as to what perhaps humanity is missing out on uh, in, in a lack of exploitation, Julia, of the ocean. Absolutely. I would say that the main thing that, that COVID-19 has shown us is that there are still undiscovered, unexpected threats out there in the world. But I would remind everybody that there's also a lot of undiscovered wonders and a lot of undiscovered solutions. Ocean science only gets a tiny fraction of the funding that we get for medical research or for space exploration, but we can still use ocean research to find a lot of creative solutions. And what we need now is creative, untapped solutions that we can get from places like the ocean and from high-risk, discovery-driven research. Yeah, don't we ever? And we need them urgently, it would seem, at the moment. We're going to have to leave it there, but uh, Robert Blasiak, Julia Sigwart, thank you both very much indeed for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.